that you could really make money because land bank properties, the value, right, is the same as the value as every house, every other house on the block. For example, like we're using a house, right? So let's say you buy a land bank house for $3,000. That's on a block where the rest of the houses are 80000 90000 So once you renovate that house, you're not going to spend ninety grand to renovate it, right? You'll spend much less. The value is going to look just like every other house on the block. So now automatically the value of that house is going to be eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. When realistically, you might have only spent like $23,000. Yeah. So for those people that need a house, there's a shortage of starter homes. There's a shortage of affordable housing in all of these cities, right, That have the, where land banks exist. So now you could potentially take a couple that needs a starter home that can't afford like um, 100000 200000 or whatever, $100,000, right? They might have had some issues with their credit. They might not have had a job for two years where... Um, they don't qualify for a loan because you know to qualify for a loan with the banks, you need two years um, experience on the job, two years tax return, an excellent credit or a certain credit, 680, 640, 700. Now, and I owe oh, the down payment be crazy. They be playing so much games with the down payment, bro. Sometimes it be zero. Sometimes the interest be high. Sometimes the down payment be low. But I never seen nobody get those programs either. I never seen nobody say, oh, I went to such and such bank and I got, I got this house with zero down. I never seen that. Is that even yeah. possible? I mean, with land banks, it will be. Yeah, yeah with land banks, you're going to cash out. <clears throat> but now with that strategy, you're offering somebody. It's so appealing to those people that necessarily can't get in a traditional way. They could finance the house through you. You're the bank. You only pay three thousand and maybe twenty thousand dollars in repairs. So you in twenty three thousand, you're gonna sell it for seventy five thousand um, dollars. They're gonna sell it finance, so they're gonna make their payments to you under that contract and agreement. But again, they don't own the house until they pay it off completely. You're gonna keep the deed. Mm. Now you're gonna get paid every single month from that house or that piece of land until it's paid off. So you get to actually decide. You could do a 10-year term. With land, I usually do two years. And it typically gets paid off quickly. So most of the time, like, I got properties now in Pennsylvania that I bought for $600. If you go on land.com, you'll see my listings, right? <laughs> I got five of them. But I was selling them for 15000 Here's the thing. When you do your listings, you're going to take the records from the county, the tax assessment records. It's going to say how much the land is valued at. So sometimes the, and my strategy with real estate is to buy low and sell low, right? It ain't buy low and sell high. That's just being greedy. That's the old way that like, like we talking about, I want a hundred and like 90 people paying me monthly, $300, $600, $800, right? I'm not going to try and sell a property I paid $600 for that's worth 23000 for 23 I'm going to try to sell like eighteen, mm. And I'm going to show the county records in my listings that this property is worth $18,000. So now you're looking at it. You're seeing it. Oh, you know, Queens County, Brooklyn, um, you know, Kings County. You're looking at the tax assessed value for the property. It's worth 23000 I'm selling it, selling finance, right? All you got to do is make one down payment to me. And you get the rights to the property. So you could do whatever you want with the property. You got full control of it. I just got the deed. Wow. That that is crazy. I definitely did want to ask another question too. So like yeah. as a newbie like investor, you know, like somebody that's just getting into real estate. Because mm -hmm. like, say for example, I live in New York and land banks are, you know, too freaking and frequent in New mm -hmm. York. It's probably it might be like a Detroit or something like that. Yeah. Would you advise a new investor to be, you know, investing outside of their home state? Like, because now you got to fly, you know, now and that's a cost. Yeah. So and forth and then the hotel and the rental. Does it make sense to, you know, invest out of state? It does. But if you like, if you want to get your feet wet, make some money and then and then start investing with the with the house, with the house money. Right. You could do land. So buying land out of state is easy. There's no maintenance on land. You don't got to go clean it. You don't really have to go cut the grass. There's no plumbing. You don't got to go wrap the pipes in the wintertime to, to, so they don't freeze. You don't have to do any of that stuff with land. 
So I would say you could get your money up and learn the game and understand like what land banks are a sweet spot. Me being in the game so much, I kind of understand and I know here's the secret to how I make so much money, right? I study counties when they do their tax assessment. So every year or a couple of years, counties reassess properties and they reassess the value of the properties, right? So that's how your taxes go up and down. Counties reassess and say, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, these brownstones went up. Your taxes are now going to go up. So with land, the like for an acre, let's just say real, real scenario, uh, Wayne County, Pennsylvania. I got to know that they did their tax reassessment. So all the properties that cost six hundred dollars that were worth four thousand dollars are now worth sixteen and twenty thousand dollars. Mm. I went crazy, right? So I'll I, I, so I go to the auction, right? I ain't tell nobody. I told maybe, I just put a quick text the day before to the land bank team. I'm like, hey, I'm gonna shoot to this auction in Pennsylvania. Here's what it looked like. 20 people came, mm-hmm. right? That's in-house, Those that's family. Well, yeah. So we show up at the auction. You know, I got a bag full of money, but um, I didn't know exactly how much I was gonna buy. <laughs> I didn't know. I honestly, I'm gonna keep it on. I didn't. I knew it was real, but I was like, "This is too good, bro!" Like these numbers are sick. So I'm in the auction. It's like twelve people, and then it's us. We deep, right? So you know us, right? The girls is dressed up. They they decked out heels, makeup, everything. And I'm walking in. I soup always super casual, like a t-shirt, some jeans, whatever. Like I don't care what I wear. I just I I don't care. It don't matter to me. I go wear the same t-shirt for three days. So I don't care. <laughs> right? I just don't care. So so we in there, and they like yo who like who's that guy? So we start in the auction, and they they ringing off price six hundred properties. They running the properties off, and I'm talking to my assistant. I'm like. Nobody's buying these. She like, uh, I'm like, all right, where's our page? So she turned to the page and she's like, all right, we got, we, we want this, this, this. She's pointing them out. And I just started winning them like crazy. So I got 13 properties, all valued $20,000 or more. My net worth increased in one day, $260,000. Dang. I happen to be doing an application for a new spot. Uh, right. <laughs> I ain't going to say the state, right? A vacation spot. Right. And yo, they asked me net worth. I was like, yo, I just went, I just grew a quarter million dollars. I was like, oh, that's easy. I started putting down like all the properties and I'm like, this is the fastest way, mm. the easiest way, the least competitive way to like make money. It's safe because it's land. It, it, it can't disappear, right? Nobody can steal it. Um, you can buy them in a day based on what auctions you go to. And, like, it's just not risky. There's, there's very little risk associated with it. Charles, I, I see you and your mentees. Y'all outside. Y'all, y'all in the field. Y'all walking around different, you know, looking at different lands. Y'all in the auctions and things like that. Which one of your mentees are, like, can you give us like a mentee testimony story? Like which one of them turned up from Lambex? Yo, that's a great question. Yo, my mentees be lying to me, bro. The <laughs> mentees be lying. So look, I did two challenges recently. I did one, Deeds Under Trees, which the concept was instead of buying gifts for your kids, like toys and sneakers and stuff, buy them land and houses and give those under trees instead. So our net worth and generational wealth could get bigger, could start to build up. Yeah. So the concept was we want everybody to win. It was like three, four hundred people. Right. They all bought one property, which I made sure because I want everybody to be successful. So I'm like, everybody buy. So everybody bought. Right. Then after the challenge, there's like an extra level of support. So when I'm doing the extra level of support, they're like, oh, yeah. So I got eight properties. So I got nine properties. I'm like, wait, the challenge just ended two days ago. How you both, how you went from one to eight? And they'd be like, well, you know, uh, I, some people be like, I, they won property by accident. I'll be like, how? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so after that, we did the buy the block initiative. Mm. And um, that, that 
um, challenge. That was a five day challenge we did where we wanted them to buy collectively next to each other. Like we just bonded as a family in the five day challenge and we strategically seeked out properties to own so we could start to own, own um, like communities together. Mm -hmm. That same concept was one out of like get one and then we're going to teach them how to build in like an extra support session called dirt to development where we take them from having the dirt all the way to development. Man, we got somebody named Candace. She got two houses and 13 pieces of land, all from a five day challenge. And and I had to pull that out of her. I, I'm like, how many houses you got? And somebody was like, Charles, you being funny. I'm like, I, I'm like, how many houses you got? She was like, two. No, she said just two. And I said, how many pieces of land you got? She said 13. And I was like, so you got 15 properties? She was like, yeah. Like she was like, yeah, what's like, like, what's wrong with that? And I'm like, damn, that's kind of crazy. That is, that's, that's, that's wild. That's wild. That's wild. So, so yeah. from what I know, one person got 15 properties. 15 properties. Yes. Doc, her name is Dr. Candace. God damn. And, now that's <clears throat> so we hear more too. Like I know a, there's a lot with 12, 13, 14, because once you know the auction sites, you can easily buy them. And then I'm I'm kind of in with some of the people at the land bank. Mm -hmm. So if I if I refer you to a land bank that might have eighteen hundred properties, I could say sort it by parcel number, right? That's like the the property social security number, mm -hmm. like that they identify property with. So I say sort it by that number. That's going to give you all the properties that they have on the same street. They're giving them in sequential order. So you could pick six seven properties out, call the land bank. Right. And say, hey, I'm on the land bank team. Um, Charles says, hi, I'd like to know if um, I could get these six properties, these four properties. And you could actually buy a block like that. Wow. So it's not uncommon, but they don't they don't because I want I'll be want everybody to have them. I'll be telling people, like, don't go too crazy because I want you to develop them. I want you to cash flow them. I want you to have an exit strategy. Now, if you buy seven and you say you're going to sell them and I see them listed on Facebook, Craigslistland.com, unsoldland.org, and I see them, I'm like, I, I like what you're doing. But if you're trying to develop 10 properties at one time, it's going to be hard because because mm -hmm. to build might be like 160, 170,000. So unless you got one point seven million, which I know some of them don't. Um, I'd be like, just slow down because you got to pay taxes on those properties too. And you hit yeah. a million cards to it. Yeah, it is. It, it's, I try to simplify it. So every cohort, like to buy a house and renovate, I got a workbook, a 10 step workbook that lays all the steps out and all the resources you need for land to buy and sell land. I got a workbook, like how to research it, how to look it up, how to sort what you want, how to buy, how to sell, how to list. Everything is like in there. And then, um, yeah, man, that's, those are some of the programs. That, 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 that's really dope. But, I just want to ask one last thing, too, because, um, you know, out here in New York, we got a lot of like, you know, a lot of tenant nightmare stories. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> how, how, how does like, you know, investing in land banks, how do you protect your cash flow and how do you stay away from crazy tenants like people squatting in your house, all type of craziness? Oh, that's crazy. So look. The land bank team, we got, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy you brought that up, bro. And you know, um, yo, New York City real estate, you can get shot, stabbed, or killed <laughs> as a landlord or a tenant, right? It'd be crazy. Right or wrong, you, you read, we hear it every day. It's getting more and more crazy. Like, they setting apartments on fire. They clogging the toilets before they leave. New York City real estate is absolutely crazy. Don't do it. It's a, it's a, it's a tenant friendly state. Stay away from New York City. Real estate is horrible. Um, here's what I do. So most of my investments are out of state. I still own properties like in the Bronx, and like two, three family homes. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, my recent investments are in um, landlord friendly states. So I'll do that research to find out. And I've gone this far as going to sit inside landlord tenant court in the Midwest. For the most part, they, they'd be like, are you paying or are you leaving? And that's that's it. And, and if, for the tenant. So if I go to if I take you to court as a tenant and you backed up four months in, the, in your rent, they're going to be like, Mr. Brown, are you paying or are you leaving? Which one is it? If you got the money, like pay that man. If not, all right, you leaving, you, you got 21 days. 
those are the those are the that's the type of research though like i made it easy for people to do but i had to go do that homework i had to go go sit in court i had to go find out where's this where's the um courthouse at and i had to watch i had to do research facebook groups will tell you a lot um you can go in there for real estate investment groups and you can ask how how's the landlord court um has anybody had trouble getting a tenant out um, do any people have trouble renting to tenants? Because sometimes you might go in the wrong place and, and build this property and nobody rents it. And it just sits there. Mm. So, yeah, man, <clears throat> you got to just do your homework. It's all about doing homework and research. That's the best part about investing out in New York. That's, you don't got to deal with some of that. Yeah. So the right management company will help you. Here, I'll give three ways to protect your property, your rental property or your investment out of state. Use a, use, a, use a management company, right? That takes your personal feelings out of it. It's not you asking questions. You don't even get to know them. So you don't see the, the single person with the kid who, who really needs a place to stay. It stays about business because you're not asking those questions. <clears throat> you only ask in qualifying questions. You qualify, you end. And these are qualifying questions that will probably make the person a good tenant. There's no guarantee. Doctors lose their jobs and don't pay. Lawyers, nurses, yep. engineers. It all happens, right? So there's no one way, but your screening process is huge and you want to take yourself out of it because naturally, right, we're empathetic to people. We're in position now to rent. So it's like we want to bless somebody. But if you could take that out of it and you just rent to the best possible tenant that applied, your chances of not having turnover and default are a lot higher. The second thing you want to do to protect your investment as a invest as a real estate investor, you want to spend extra money in getting warranties for your roof, your electrical, and your plumbing. So when a tenant calls you, you don't have to go do that work. You don't got to call your management company where they're going to charge you to go do the work. You're going to call the company that installed the brand new plumbing and say, "Hey, I know this is under warranty." The tenant has an issue. Could you go fix it? It doesn't cost you anything. It's easy to do. And they usually being that they warranty the work, they're going to fix it the right way so they don't have to keep coming out. So being a good landlord, having a really good screening process. And the third thing I'm going to tell you, um, always use your gut. Your gut never lies. Um, red flags do not turn green. So if you're supposed to meet with a tenant at eight o'clock, they hit you with five excuses and they show up at nine. That's a red flag, right? They should be presented, presenting themselves a certain way, being that they're going to come in the spot from you, right? If they're not presenting themselves well, that's a red flag. That they're not taking care of themselves. They're probably not going to take care of your property. They're not showing up on time. They're probably not going to pay the rent on time. Those are things that, yeah, you go there, you see that, single mother, baby crying, snotty nose, whatever, and you want to give her a chance, those red flags are not going to turn green. She's going to be late on the rent, right? She's not even going to contact you to tell you she's not paying. You might go over there to collect the rent. She won't say, I don't have it. Now you flew from New York to Cleveland, New York to Detroit. It's the first. You leaving tomorrow, she don't got the rent. You might go collect from other tenants, but she don't got it. So it's like, use your gut and just always know red flags do not turn green with tenants. Red flags do not turn green with contractors. If that contract is hard to reach before you start working with him, he's going to be hard to reach when you start working with him.